title of the message today is entitled, Who Knows What the Lord Will Do? Three times in Scripture, the Bible uses the exact words three times it, 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 it's spoken when uh, the judgment of God has been pronounced. It's either over a people or it's been pronounced by a prophet or, or even kings. And, 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 and God tells them, the prophet to speak, the preacher to speak. He pronounces the judgment. And then the prophet goes back and three times after judgment is pronounced. God says this is a closed deal. It's over. Right? I'm done. I'm pronouncing judgment. And then God comes after the man of God has opened up his mouth. Then the, 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 God comes back and the word of God says, who knows, but who knows what the Lord will do. Let me give you an example. David, uh, this was a man that was after God's own heart. He was in a place where he shouldn't be. He was looking at what he shouldn't be looking at, looking at a beautiful woman bathing as he's looking from his beautiful castle. And he sees her. He's gripped with infatuation. With, he's overcome with passion for her. He's consumed in his mind that he has to have for her. He uses his authority as the king to call on her. She's a married woman. Seduces her, has an affair uh, with her. He, she gets pregnant. When she's pregnant, uh, he arranges for the murder of her husband so that he's not found out. I'm just saying. Nathan the prophet comes in and tells him, hey, listen to me. You could have had anything, like you, the, 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 the kingdom is yours. You could have had any lamb from here but this one lamb was left to this man and you took it from him David is broken David repents he says he's sorry nine months later uh, Bathsheba gives birth to that baby that son of David that baby is deathly ill and David immediately goes to a place of brokenness, he's fasting, he's praying, he's put on sackcloth, he's dirty, he won't eat anything for seven days. And then one of his servants comes and tells him uh, that the kid had passed away and as soon as he tells him the baby, which was maybe seven days, eight days old, had died, David gets up from that floor, dusts himself off, bathes, anoints himself, he's anointed with oil, puts on his cologne the whole night, fixes his hair, and, and the people ask him, why did you do that? I mean, why, why did you fast and pray? And David said this, he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and I wept because I thought, can you say it with me? It should be on the screen behind me. Who knows? The Lord may be gracious and to me and let the child live. Three times the Bible says, who knows? Will the Lord relent? Will he change his mind? Will he be merciful? You see it when uh, the prophet Joel tells God's people to turn to the Lord. And, 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 and you know, they were in the midst of, because God had pronounced judgment. He told them, turn to me. And, and then Joel says this. He says, turn to the Lord for he's gracious and he's, com he's compassionate. He's, God is slow to anger. He's abounding in love and devotion. And sometimes... When I hear the prophet of God, the man of God, the woman of God, so pompous in their thought, and I get it, sin grieves the heart of God. And if you're right with God when you see it, nobody wants to, no Christian wants to be around it. It, it feels, it's, it's icky. It's like, I, you know, I want to get out of here. 
but yet there's never a sense of faith that's released or a sense of the first attribute and the one that is most important, the attribute of God that God wants everybody to know. It's not mentioned. And what is it that the Lord is gracious and the Lord is kind? He is slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion. And Joe goes on to say, who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind. If you'll just seek him, if you'll turn to him. Jonah, if you remember, he didn't want to go and preach the message of God's judgment to Nineveh. He swallowed, he gets thrown off a ship, he's swallowed by a whale, living in the belly of a whale for three days until he says, okay, God, I'm going to do it. The whale throws him up, up on the, the shore, and then he goes and preaches judgment to Nineveh. Listen to me. Nineveh was not an, a, 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 an, an Israelite community. It wasn't an Israelite state. It was part of Babylon. There was a culture that was counter to the culture of God. And so uh, uh, Jonah goes and he preaches the message that God, God's going to judge you. God, ju judgment is being pronounced. And the king, a leader of a pagan nation, turns around to the people and he tells the people, listen to me, we need to, we need to, we need, we need to, we need to, we need to fast. We need to, we need to pray. We need to seek the Lord for his mercy, for his for his kindness, and because he says this, who knows? God may relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Now, not the same words, but the prophet Amos says the same thing. He just uses, uses the word, perhaps the Lord will relent. Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah uses the word perhaps. Jeremiah is in the courtyard of the house of God. He's preaching the judgment of God and telling the people, just turn, just turn to God. Return back to the Lord. And, and he says, perhaps he will listen and he will turn. Listen, who knows what the Lord will do? And the prophets preached it then and I preach it to you now. Who knows what the Lord will do? Even published sociologists and international relationship scholars all over the world are affirming the word of God. They're, they're affirming the Bible, and what the Bible has said all along. And, and, and what is it? Listen to me. They have discovered uh, uh, God's process that's mentioned in Daniel, uh, the second chapter, verse 21. Uh, I'm sorry, tw second Daniel 2020. Here's the process. This is, what, this is what the Bible says. God said, I am the God who raises up kings, and I am the God who disposes kings. Now, I know that there's an election right around the corner. Prayerfully, some of you have already gone and voted prayerfully, right? But when you, you know, and I know it could be like, what's going to happen? And it's, it's all over. Uh, if it were my opinion, uh, you, you know, if I, if, if I thought maybe I'd get elected president, I'd run for president. I think I'd, maybe I could do a better, I, maybe I'd be a better candidate. I don't know. But, but, but what we know is regardless of what everybody else is trying to sell us, what we know is that God raises up kings and God sits kings down. And, and God does this based upon this premise. You find it in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, verse 34, when God says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns a people. Now, some translation says sin is a reproach. Other translation says condemns. In other words, it brings, it brings judgment to a people. If you're taking notes, let me tell you about what, the, what these international uh, uh, relations scholars have written about, these, these, pronoun, uh, uh, prof, uh, the, the, these sociologists that are, that, that are, are counseling, giving advice to, 
governments and, 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 and presidents and legislatures all over the world. Let, here's what they write about. It's called the global cycle theory. And in the global cycle theory, there are three phases uh, uh, that repeat uh, uh, the international uh, power system, right? Like there's a cycling of who's in power all across the globe. And, 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 and in uh, the 5,000 years of recorded history, we've been through tw 26 this cycle 26 times, and right now uh, they, they write and, t and tell us that we are in the 27th repetition of the cycle. In other words, it's just beginning. So the cycle begins with what's called a multipolar world. And a multipolar world is when you have three or more uh, uh, great powers uh, countries uh, of equal power, they're great powers, but they will fight each other for control of the world. And the reason why they're fighting is because they're of equal power. Uh, they have equal, equal economic strength or military strength, and they want dominance. They want world dominance. Eventually, there are wars, and, and, and most, most of them will lose their power. And then we have what's called a bipolar world. And that's where two powers are fighting each other. So you go from many, three or more, then you go to two. The two big boys begin fighting each other. Then one of them will lose their power, and then there is what's called a uni, uh, unipolar world. And that's where you have a one global superpower. And then what happens all throughout history, uh, that one global superpower will become sinful, lazy, prideful, and arrogant. So, that, uh, so that's when Proverbs 14 kicks in. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns of people. So God steps in at that point. And as soon as you cross the barrier from a unipolar world, right, uh, where you have a superpower, uh, uh, then uh, you go into a multipolar world, and that's when you have what's called world wars. Now, I know that probably uh, we are all informed people, even young people today. Now, I don't know, you know, from which source you're getting your information, but I'm pretty sure all of us have heard talks about uh, we are currently on the verge of, an, of another world war. Am I talking to the right people? I don't want to be irrelevant. I, 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 and I know that for some, you're saying, I can't think about that. Because my life is such a mess right now. To think about that would crush me. I got it, but you're not an ostrich. You are a child of the line of the tribe of Judah. You don't, you don't stick your head in the sand. Okay, let me go on. I just got sassy for a minute. All right, so, so I need to talk to grown-up people here for a moment. And God's going to minister to you personally, but I need to talk the big picture. You know that Israel just struck Iran. It is an escalation to the conflict that is taking place in the Middle East right now. You know that. All right, so, 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 so what ends up happening is uh, 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 that uh, all of a sudden you have this global tension uh, that you see that that we see is happening right now. I mean, you got Russia and Ukraine, that, con that war going on. You got China threatening Taiwan over and over again, and it's just testing the waters. What you got to understand, it's just testing the waters. It's testing the strength of the superpower. Do you understand? Like, are you going to intervene? And I'll, I got to stay here. I'll never finish. I was about to leave this pulpit. What I'm saying, if you are the big brother in the family and you see somebody else beating up on the little brothers that's bigger, that you have to step up, and even if it takes force, right, you got, you got, to, you got to stop the fight. 
Oh, you follow what I'm saying, right? It's the same thing that happens. So th there's a testing of the waters. So uh, we got Israel and Iran. I, I mean, nationally, we got two powers. It's called Trump and Harris, Republican and Democrat. I'm, come on, man. Don't, don't get mad at me. Say, say, Pastor, you're getting political in the pulpit. Listen, yes, absolutely. Why? Uh, because it has to do with your faith, right? And I'm going to address that. So that's called the global cycle theory. The national cycle, uh, cycle therapy, in the national cycle, ther cycle theory, uh, sociology, this, it, this is a sociological theory that says every society, every group of people, every nation, community, uh, will go through a cycle every hundred years. So uh, there's... 20 years of a high time where everything's working well for the, uh, for the, the, the economy's healthy, the, you, you know, et cetera, everything's great, right? I mean, then that leads to 20 years of an awakening. And, and, and listen, the awakening is both a spiritual awakening as well as a secular, uh, 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 secular values awakening, right? So there's a, there's a fight. There's a, there, there's a, and then that leads to 20 years of an unraveling. And, and then that leads to 20 years of crisis. Now, if you want to know, let me, let me draw the picture real, real quick here. It, here in the, in the United States of America, we were at our high in the cycle in 1945 at the end of World War II. Our, our economy, our military were the only ones that were left standing. I mean, I mean, high above all the rest throughout the world, right? So we were at our high. Then we, uh, starting about 20 years later in the mid-60s mid, uh, mid to late 60s, uh, we, we, we entered into that awakening cycle. Uh, that's when we had the whole Jesus people movement. Young people, you don't know much about church in history. That's when pot-smoking young people went to Jesus. I'm just saying, I'm, they're getting saved left and right. You got the Cal Calvary uh, uh, Chapel uh, movement, right? Uh, all that stuff and people getting baptized. Well, but at the same time, there was also uh, a secular values awakening. Well, how does that happen? So at the same time, we have in 1962, 1963, there's the removal of prayer and the Bible from public schools. It's a, it's a fight, right, between God presence versus uh, God denial, right? You don't have authority over my life, right? Like that, that's the secular portion. I mean, we, have, we, we have the explosion of the drug cult culture then. We have the sexual revolution that goes in during the, that, that time, free love, all that. And all of it initializes the destruction of the family. And that's where we're at today. I mean, statistics will tell you. Look at the incarceration rate. Over 80% of those incarcerated do not have a godly, they, they come from broken homes where there is no godly, there was no godly father in the home. He didn't stay in the home. Uh, don't get mad at me. I'm, I'm going to give you the answer. God is for you. I, I'm just telling you, I can't say, well, no, I'm not going to talk about it today. Right? It's, there's a problem. There's a problem when I'm going to a football game in St. Martinville and before the kickoff, some young man is shooting somebody else at the football game. Friday night football. Sorry. I see. Ain't right. Something is gone amiss. Oh, come on, am I talking to the right people here? Will you be patient with me today? I promise. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm 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 to bring this back around. I promise. But what I'm saying is this war initiates the, uh, you know, a spiritual awakening and a, and a secular awake, awakening, initializes all, all that stuff that happened. It, you, you know, so we have illegalized, we have legalized abortion in the 60s. Right? We've, we've got increases in violent crime, so on and so forth. So all of that sets us up, the USA, America, uh, uh, it, you know, for the next stage. Well, we see this in 1986 uh, because at that point, divorce is skyrocketing, drug abuse, 
alcohol abuse, edu uh, uh, educational systems are declining, declining. Everybody's looking at the public, ed at public schools and saying, why aren't our kids making the grades? Right? Like, like, well, because they're having to parent instead of teach. I'm just, don't get mad. Don't get mad. Please, don't get mad. Right? Don't, don't, don't. I'm going to give you an answer. Stay with me. And, and so we have educational system declining. Then you have government taking a nosedive, declining. Well, in 1992, the USA officially becomes a superpower internationally. Well, why? Because that's when you have the collapse on December the 26th of 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. Communist Soviet Union collapses. It loses all of Ukraine, all those other little nations. They say, no, we don't want no part of that. So the U.S. The US becomes the official superpower, right? So finally, in 2009, what do we see? Here in America, we are in an economic crisis in 2009. Now, according to the national cycle theory, that is going to last for about 20 years, and that brings us up to 2029. And because of where we're at at the end of that cycle, what we have is we have a world stage that is once again being set up for the next multipolar world. China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, India is making a grab for global dominance. Both India and China have said, uh, we have millions and millions of mil and millions. It don't matter if our people die. We're going to live. They have a zombie sort of mentality. They don't value the life. They value the power. Does that make sense, everybody, right? So in other words, most international experts uh, uh, who, uh, you know, will tell you that we, they know that we are on the verge of another possible world war. Okay, long time to set that up. Here's the question that we're not, nobody's saying it's hard to address all of this on a Sunday morning, right? But, but the real question for you is how do I live? How do we live? How to live in times like these? Nationally, our communities, our families broken. How do, you know, when the foundations are destroyed, the Bible says, what, what are the righteous to do? I want to answer that question today. Can I do that today? Can I do that? Well, how to live? Well, there are three callings in a time like this to be answered. The first calling is a call to faith. Our text we read simply said this. I'm not going to read it. Let me just say it. It simply said this. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 3 said this. We are born again into a living hope. Now, the Bible says... When you're a Christian and you have a loved one that passes away, right? When we grieve, we don't grieve like the rest of the world because we have a hope that they don't have. Well, well, so, so listen to me. When you're born again, you were born again into a living hope. Now, l l listen, uh, to fear is to be human. To be hopeful and courageous in the face of fear is to be a born-again, spirit-filled believer. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So to encourage your faith, let me remind you of a couple of things, right? Let me begin by saying this. Uh, Bobby, as a born-again child of God, uh, someone who says Jesus is the Lord of my life, Right? He's the one that controls my future. Listen, let, me, let me say this. Let me say this. Let, listen to me. My hope is not in kings or in rulers or in government officials. It's not in Kamala Harris 
or Donald J. Trump. My hope is in the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It don't matter what like Christians getting depressed at election time. It don't make no sense. No sense. Let me tell you what the Bible says. In Psalms 143, verse 3 says this. The psalmist said, don't put your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in human beings who cannot save. One translation says, who ca they, they cannot help you. Like everybody's thinking that the quality of life is dependent upon the next president of the United States. Maybe if Jesus is not your Lord, it might be, but not Bobby. My quality of life is secure in Jesus. Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Now listen to me. You believe that the government is your answer to your economic stability, and you're under a curse. That's what I just read. What did you read? Did you read the same thing? So at the end of the day, listen to me, the Lord God is sovereignly and in control. And I've been, I've been born again. I've been born again into a living hope. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 says this. Listen, and God changes times and seasons. I love the New Living Translation. It says it like this. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. Now, I don't know which God you're serving, but I, I, I serve the one who is, who is the Lord of all lords, who is sovereign over all the earth. And, and listen, if that don't encourage your faith, no matter what we're facing in the world, because that that's what's happening, Right? If America remains immoral, then we lose. It's a reproach. And if somebody else that will say, no, what you guys are practicing over there? I mean, when Russia seems to have more morality in terms of, you know, relationships than we do, th th then they say, well, no, you, you guys are mad. You're insane. I mean, you're encouraging crime. You're, well, well. I, so I'm the big brother. Let me step back up and I'll, 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 I'll settle this issue in this area of the world. Well, listen to me. At the end of the day, so, so, so at the, but at the end of the day, my hope is not in who's going to be the next elected president of the United States. My hope is in Jesus. And, 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 and because he is sovereign and he's in control of all of the world's events. Now, now watch this. Psalms 21 uh, Proverbs 21, verse 1 says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he turns, he turns it wherever he pleases. So, look, my practice has been, and I am very, I, I, I think as, as, a, as a man of God, I have a responsibility for the well-being of my community. I don't believe the shenanigans and lie that says, you know, uh, uh, the church shouldn't be involved in politics. The reason why the nation is in the condition it's in is because spirit-filled believers aren't involved and getting their hands dirty. You, you know what I mean. I'm, I'm not saying being corrupt, but I'm, because you're not involved. You won't take the time to call. You won't take the time to pray even. Don't, don't look at me pious. I love you. You don't pray. Don't tell me that. Oh, yes, I pray. No, you, listen. I, I, I determined a long time ago, if I had to, to deter, if, if, if I had to, uh, uh, you know, lean upon you to pray for me, me to pray me into heaven, I'd be, I'd be in hell. Because you know it's true. Come on, man. Just love me a little bit. We say it as a kind gesture. I'm praying for you. Just, be, just being real. What, so so what, am I try, what am I saying? What I'm, I'm trying to encourage your faith today. 
God controls the course of the world events. He removes kings and he sets up other kings. In other words, listen to me, there's a limit to the amount of evil the Lord will allow on the earth. He will put an end to it. He will judge it. And this is why Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. So what you might be saying, no, I know, because, you know, Lord, the, the world should be judged. I mean, uh, it, it's all a mess, or I, I got that. But God knows when the judge, and not only that, but he knows how to deliver those who have been made righteous by the sacrifice of Jesus' blood on Calvary's tree. And when I put my hope in Jesus, that blood is applied to me, and he knows how to rescue me. Somebody ought to give God praise right there. Are you guys okay? Can, can, uh, I, I, I've been... Are you okay? Can I finish this today? I don't want to do a part two. Some people might never come back. I got one shot at this thing. This is God's process. He's not going to allow evil to continue to increase. He says there's a limit. There's a lid to it. He did it in the days of Noah. And he chose Noah. Noah uh, was a man of righteousness. He's preaching. He's building an ark. In other words, I'm preaching right, righteousness, but there's a way to escape it. Judgment's coming, but there's a way to escape it. Right? Like, and when judgment comes, it was too late. The doors were done sealed, and those who had, whose hands were on a part of that family and were on that ark, building that ark. Don't shout me down. I'm preaching good on Sunday morning. They were saved. It happened in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was, God said, I got a limit. Right? The man of God, Abraham, prays. And, of course, the angels of God, they, they, they pull Lot out. And his wife is still looking back. Like, wait a minute. You just had all kind of, all kind of folk at your door. Try, they they want to have sex with angels. They want to rape these men. And, 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 and you're looking back, <laughs> you, you know, like you're all sad because you're, the city just got burnt? Like, are you serious? But God knows how to deliver the righteous from the judgment. In other words, what, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that, that there's a limit to the amount of evil that God's going to allow. God will intervene. And the Bible said, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. That I might come back and preach next week. As it was in the days of Noah, so, so shall it be in the end, right before the return of Christ. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 28, uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 28. He said, when you see the seasons and the evil increasing on the earth, when you see all of these things begin to happen on the earth, he says, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. How do I live right now? I'll stand up and my head is looking up, waiting for my redemption. Somebody give God praise in the house. How do we live in times like these? We answer, number two, the call to action. Don't live depressed. Don't live all bound up in all sorts of anxiety. You don't need to go buy a, a, you know, a, doomsday, a doomsday bunker in Arizona, spending money that you don't have. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, I'm stopping right here, right now. Number one. If that doomsday scenario does happen, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like nuclear and it's, I don't want, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in your bunker. I don't want to live in Arizona in a bunker with however many other of you in a time of trouble. Love you. Just take me home, Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know. Come on, man. Can we, can we get on the same page? Here, the, listen, the righteous live by faith. 
not by fear. We walk by faith, not by sight. But pastor, don't you see the world? Don't you see the danger? Yes, but I'm looking up because my redemption is drawing near. That's the difference, everybody. <laughs> so so how, do you, how do you live? Well, listen, you don't, you don't just throw your hands up in the air and do nothing. You don't give up. You don't, you don't stop planning and opening up businesses. And You, you, you know, right now, uh, s- statistics say that, all, uh, f- I think it was five, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a wrong number, but the, the number of Christians that will not vote in this election because they're saying neither one of them are worth my vote. I just won't vote. And they won't vote. Well, what, 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 what have you done? You did like this. I give up. It's over anyway. No, 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 listen to me. No, 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 no. How do you live in times like this? You answer the call to action. Why? Because the Bible says, who knows what the Lord will do? Can you look at your neighbor and say, who knows what the Lord will do? Can you look at your other neighbor and say, who knows what the Lord will do? Let me tell you what I know. I know that God made an ironclad promise, and he said, any time, any place, and any people. Jeremiah, watch this, Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8, and if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up, I, I, I will pluck up and bring down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I intended to it. Any time, any place, and any people. Here's the call. Number one, engage spiritually. In other words, if you will humble yourself and you will pray, seek God's face, turn, God said, I will. Can I tell you why there's still hope for us? Because Tuesday night, I don't know where all of you were, but for our, our church leadership meeting, we were in my, in my living room at my house praying God's mercy. And I said, Lord, right here, there's a remnant. There's a people praying for a nation, praying for the election to come. We're saying, Jesus, you are still sovereign in your rule and in your thought. Have mercy on us. I'm just saying, everybody. Here's the call. Not only do you engage spiritually, but civically engage. That's the call to action. In other words, I'm trying to tell you today, go vote. Don't be like me and my wife on the opening day of early vote when we, when we drove up and we saw the line too long. We just kept driving. I didn't expect it. I don't know. Of course, we still had to stand in the line. Early vote, still standing in the line. I mean, God help us. Go vote. Catch it. Look, you want to quote me real quick? Those who will not exercise their freedom will lose their freedom. And as Christians, we, we, we don't vote our personal interests. We, we, we vote kingdom interests. I'm not voting cultural values. I'm voting biblical values. Amen, everybody? Well, let me show you. Look at my Bible. Now, now, I bought this from a couple of years ago, and uh, it's my favorite Bible of all time. As a matter of fact, I just shared it with somebody. I said, Pastor, I want to buy a Bible. Which one? I said, this is my favorite Bible of all times. And, and, and uh, uh, this, th- these stickers, the last two years here locally, uh, we have National Day of Prayer, right? And, 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 and it, it's so awkward. I, I mean, it can be so awkward. I don't let it, though. I really don't. But it can be so awkward because you have so many different, you know, denominations, faiths, you know what I mean, and whatever. And people come together, it can just be awkward, but it don't matter. God, God said, if my people will humble themselves and pray, right, and I'll show up, I'll show up. And so, so I, I just took the sticker, they gave me a sticker, I just put it on my Bible, I prayed, right. Then again this year, I prayed. And then when I come out that voters box, you know how to give you that voter thing? I just stuck it on my Bible, I voted. How do you live in a time like this? You engage spiritually. God's people pray. We pray every Wednesday here. 
right? There's a prayer meeting here every Sunday at 6, sorry, 5.30. That's why I'm late. And when I show up, they're already gone. Pray. All right, let me close, right? How do you live in times like this? Listen, answer the call to Christ. Because it's in times like these when you need to draw close to Jesus. And, 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 and the Lord told me this, right? Like, there's some, when times get bad in your life, you blame God for the bad. When things are up, don't blame God for your bad marriage. You don't blame God because you don't have enough money. You, I, don't, I don't get mad at God because, you know, that nabbit, my, my AC's acting up. You, you, you follow me? No? When the times get tough. That's when you draw close to God. James said, draw near to God, and he draws near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now listen, I never want to be the devil's advocate and preach condemnation. I never want to do that. There's a way of escape. And so, so let me help you out, sinner, because I am all the same. <laughs> I can have a, it's a, just a transparent moment. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm walking in prayer. And I'm like, okay, Lord, sometimes there's sin against the Lord, and then there's sin against your conscience, right? Or there's a fight in the conscience, and God's, he's indifferent about it. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. But it's your conscience, you know what I mean? Like your own conscience. It's your own, whatever you would say was moral or immoral or, and I was walking, and I was like, Lord, uh, you know, I, I, I need you to help. Every Sunday I got to get up, and I got to tell people that I've been in the presence of God. And this is what the Lord told me to tell you. And I'm under a little bit of pressure right now because I don't even like me very much. Oh, thank you for loving me. I'm glad somebody loved me. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm going to receive that right there. And I'm just having this one, this comrade, God, help me. God, can you wash my, you know, all that, just prepare me. People don't need to, they don't need to hear me, they need to hear you. I'm just kind of, and, 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 and then there was this, and so now I'm just talking, honestly. And I said, you know, Lord, really, uh, I'm over here praying, feeling about, you know, now I'm, like, 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 oh, I'm feeling pressure. I got to, you know, uh, I got to get the, and, and, I, and here was my, here's what, I, here's what I told the Lord. I said, honestly, Lord, I, really, I'm not, I'm really not all that. Why am I spending all this time? And, you know, like, I'm really not all that. And immediately he said, but I think you're all that. I think you're all that. And so what am I trying to tell you? There's somebody here today. You can say, man, I'm a mess. I'm just a just a mess. I'm a dirty mess. There's a difference between weakness and wickedness. God judges wickedness. Weakness he is ever compassionate about. God will forgive the brokenhearted. But the wicked is the one that knowingly, intentionally, deliberately practices a very clear line. It's it's. It's, it's, it's not a matter of conscience. It's, it's, a, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's one, God, a precedent that God set that can't be, and, 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 and you know, but God, I'm, I'm, I'm failing, right? How many of you guys uh, say that you've never lied? Okay. How many of you guys say, would say, you've, never, you, you've, you've always given the whole truth? No. You're lying now. Because there are times when we won't tell everybody everything, so we're withholding that, right? So now are we, are we delivering a false witness? I don't know. Uh, I think that's too much in the weed. That's too much religious. That's too much garbage for me, right? I think God's gracious. But what I'm saying is when you knowingly, deliberately are deceiving people for harm, 
right? Like at that point, it's, it's, it's called wicked. But to be weak, like, God, I don't want to do this. But I did it anyway. Well, that's, that's weakness. And, and the Lord is merciful in that capacity. I can't help but think that there's someone here today that you're just undone, man. You're tired. And sin's heavy. And you know it's, you know, you're a mess. And, 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 and you're saying, Pastor, you're talking about the sin of the world. I'm, 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 I'm having a hard time with my own sin. Just trying to show this or deal with that. Listen, maybe you feel like that woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And brought before Jesus a crowd of people. You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, not only is she guilty, because she was, she was caught. She's in the bed. They were doing the thing. See, nobody likes to think about that. Oh, we're in church. Pastor, why are you talking about? It's in the Bible. Caught. She's caught. And let me tell, let me tell you how I think. Because I think it's the way that Jesus thinks. Not only is she guilty, can you imagine? She's guilty. I know I'm guilty. I'm busted. But she's totally ashamed in that moment. Can you imagine? And not only is she totally ashamed, but she's trembling in fear as she's standing in the middle of a crowd and standing before Jesus. Listen to me. This woman isn't only guilty. This woman was hurting. Now, I don't have a clue as to what was the pain in her heart that drove her into that bed of adultery that day. I don't know. But she was hurting. If her life was fulfilled with her husband, come on. If she was at peace, if she... I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure the likelihood of that adulterous affair would have been lessened. I don't know. I, I believe most people medicate. Uh, you sin to medicate some sort of pain. Whether it's I'm lacking something, right? Or, or they use sin to medicate their, their pain. That, that's what drugs do. That's what alcohol does and listen you can you can drink the best whiskey here I, I'm gonna I'm gonna drink the best whiskey when I get to heaven I'm just saying I look forward to drinking tequila in heaven don't get religious on me it's wine it's a, come on somebody <laughs> hallelujah can't be drinking in here. Y'all say I'm going to hell, you know. <laughs> Come on, back, back. Let me, let me land this thing. But can you see this? This woman's hurting everybody. I mean, she's yanked out of that house, off of that bed. I mean, did she even, did, 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 did her accusers or, and they were right. She was caught. She broke the law. It was immoral. I mean, but, but they, did they even allow her to get dressed? I don't know. Did she just grab a blanket or something? Or they just grabbed her and pulled her out? I, I don't know. But let me tell you what I do know. And this is what's fascinating. When she's standing before Jesus, he bends down and begins to write in the dirt. And all kind of religious people want to know, what did Jesus write in the dirt? Don't matter. Because the message isn't in what he wrote. The message is in where he wrote it. For the second time, God Almighty, now clothed in flesh, reaches from heaven, stoops down, and puts his hand in dirt. He did it in Genesis when he formed Adam out of the dirt. And now he's doing it again as he's looking at this lady. And what is he saying? He's saying, 
Here's the message. I'm not afraid of your dirt. And if you feel heavy with sin today, I want you to know, Jesus is not afraid of your dirt. And he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. And his message to you today is his message, the same message to that woman that day. And he's saying, if you'll give me your dirt, if you'll give me your filth, I will apply my hands to it. I'm going to put my DNA on it. And Jesus says before all of this woman's accuser, accusers, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Listen to me. I, I heard my, my second oldest son preach this at, at, a, at a spiritual retreat weekend that we call an encounter. And he, was, he, he said, on that day, he said, let him who, who, who is without sin cast the first stone. He said, uh, if I was in that crowd, I would have taken the rock and I would throw it up in the air. <laughs> I'm the one that needs to be hit. And I think Jesus is saying before all those accusers, he's telling that woman, give me your dirt and I will rewrite your story. Let me tell you how I've designed you. Let me tell you how I uniquely fashioned and put you together in your mother's womb. Let me tell you how I created you and for what purpose, the purpose to which you were born. Let me, let me just give me your dirt. And I'm going to deposit this treasure of divine DNA into your earthen vessel. And I'm going to mix my DNA with your DNA. And I'm going to rearrange your heart. And I'm going to rearrange your life. And I will be a father to you. And you're going to be a son to me. You're going to be a daughter to me, says the Lord God Almighty. And now you don't have to go back and sin anymore. Somebody ought to stand to their feet right now. Come on, stand to your feet and give God a little praise. That Jesus is not afraid of your dirt. <laughs>